<laughs> I'm going to explain why in just a moment. <coughs> so I'll stop coughing as well. Uh, let me tweet it and Mastodon it. Uh -huh, share, copy link. I am, per the description in Tokyo. A little bit of Tokyo out there. It's a Japanese art <laughs> over there. It's Sunday morning. I was out to dinner last night. It's a Saturday night. And I went, I haven't done my video. And not only have I not done my video, but I didn't bring any of my stuff. I didn't bring my tripod. I didn't bring my good microphone or any of that sort of stuff. <clears throat> and uh, I want to go and do cool Japanese stuff today <laughs> rather than sit around and edit videos and muck around like that. So this is being very casual. Tin Quito. Hi, Trey. I'm doing well. Uh, yes, good. All right, let's know it works now. And it is streaming. Let me do that. I'll post that. I'll copy that. I'll post that to there. <clears throat> And then I'll talk about a bit of sort of fun Japan stuff before I jump into the other things because I do have some interesting, interesting stuff this week, particularly the one rep thing that just sort of popped up, I think, yesterday. It's weird, man. Really weird. But a very good, uh, very good Krebsing to talk about there. Okay, right. <clears throat> I've saved all the things, published all the Twitters and the Mastodons and all the things I normally do when I'm at home. Now, getting on to why I'm not at home. I did mention last week, it's going to be in Tokyo this week. This is just purely for fun. Oh man. Brendan, lovely typer on the Twitter there, Troy. We King Vid. I don't care anymore. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I did. Why did I do that? That was the bit that I wrote when I actually had time to. You can edit tweets now, can't you? Oh, let's do that. Thanks, Brendan. With my We King Vid. That has a nice ring to it. Edit post. It's my, oh, jeez, how do I do that? Weekly. My weekly vid. Thanks, mate. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, da, da. Let me have a look here. <clears throat> I can fix the same thing with Mastodon. I'm sure I can do that. How do you do that? Edit. Edit. <laughs> Weaking. What am I doing? Everything in Japan is a bit unusual, even my spelling. <clears throat> uh, if you've not been to Japan before, I was trying to explain it to Charlotte, and, and I think this is probably my, um, I think it's my sixth trip, uh, but I have not been here. I haven't been to Tokyo for about 20 years, and I started coming to Japan uh, because my father was a pilot, and he was based here for many, many, many years, uh, which was awesome because I got to come here first in 1992, dating myself, <laughs> but as, uh, as, as someone in my mid-teens at the time. And it was just such a, like a massive tech hub compared to the rest of the world because this was before we had the World Wide Web as we know it. Uh, we didn't have the same visibility to all the, you know, anything comes out anywhere now and you know about it all over the world. But here, like you could come here and there was all this like super weird stuff I'd never seen before, which was really cool. Uh, and I keep coming back here and a few times up to Sapporo to go snowboarding <laughs> as well. But I keep coming back here because it's just such a really, really interesting place. And I've been to a lot of cities in Asia and for the most part, you could go to, uh, let's say, Bangkok or Kuala Lumpur or Singapore or, or Manila and a lot of stuff, it, it's different, but it's similar. Where it's like, okay, mostly similarly, similar sort of food and cultural norms and things like that. But you come to Japan and it's like, this is, this is so different to everything else you've seen before. And Charlotte's been around a lot of Asia as well, but she'd never been here. And now we're spending time here. We're, I think I'm getting a new appreciation for it. Particularly the food, I've had a tweet thread going with food. Man, the food has just been like superbly epic. But all the little cultural things as well, the, the, everything from like the level of courtesy and politeness to just, it, it's the world's largest city. So to put it this way, it's twice the size of New York. If you've been in New York, so I think New York's got about 18 million people. Here is like 37 million. But it's quiet, like you barely ever hear a siren or anything like that. You're sort of wandering around all the streets and there's lots of little you know, temples and shrines and things like that. And the people are, you know, again, very courteous and polite. And it just has a, like a calm to it. Uh, I mean, it is, don't get me wrong, it is a massive city. I know you can't quite see it because of the glare there but we're looking sort of west out that way and it just, it sprawls. But there's high rises and stuff this way. When we look the other way, 
it's pretty much low rise stuff. And it's, if you've been to LA before and you look at that LA skyline, it just feels like it goes forever. It's like this, but massively more so. If you just joined in and the audio and everything sounds a little bit crappy today, <laughs> I was saying as I first started this, I forgot my tripod, I forgot microphone and stuff like that. If I'm honest, I just had a hellish few weeks leading up to this just due to being overloaded. Uh, a lot of it trying to do all the have I been pwned RDBMS stuff, which I don't even want to talk about today, but it's mostly under control. So I felt very, very behind. Looking at the comments here, okay, I fixed my typo. Matt can't, uh, Matt misses Japan, can't wait to get back to Kyoto. Uh, Tinkwita, I just want to let you know that thanks to you, I've gained more cybersecurity awareness. My Facebook got hacked and my Microsoft email almost got hacked. I now have uh, random strong passwords. Good start. Yeah, very, very good start. Hmm. And moving on to things, because I do want to like do this and then get out and actually do interesting stuff. Uh, in fact, what we're going to do today is go to Team Labs. And I'm not exactly sure what Team Labs is. I just know that everyone said you've got to go to this Team Labs thing, which seems to be like some sciencey immersive kind of thing, which I guess will be right up my alley, <laughs> which will be nice. Let's talk about sponsor and then I'll get into the, uh, the good bits of the cyber things of this week. Sponsor again this week is Collide. Collide can get you cross-platform, get your cross-platform fleet to 100% compliance, zero trust for Okta. Want to see yourself book a demo. And look, as I've said many times before, Collide has been a, an awesome sponsor for, for multiple years now, I believe, off the top of my head. Uh, and they do provide demos of things. It's a great thing to go and have a look at. Go beyond skin deep compliance with comprehensive device visibility and equipment to end user remediation. Building trust from the ground up for Okta. Users fix problems without the help desk. Wish they could do that and have a bamboo. <laughs> It'd be so nice. <laughs> you define what trusted means. Yeah, that's how, there's a whole talk in itself, what trust means. Go and check out Collide. Massive thanks to them. Matt's saying, Team Labs is amazing. You'll love it. Take time and play with all the exhibits. That's cool. Oh, all right, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm not entirely sure what to expect with it. We've just been doing a lot of walking here. We did, um, day before yesterday, I walked 16K, just walking around the city, like just finding random places to, to eat and doing all the sort of little interesting things. Went out for a couple of really nice dinners. They were odd. <laughs> and one other food was really good. We went out somewhere night before last that we booked on the recommendation of someone back home. And the food was really cool, but they walk us in and they, it was basically like, here's your jail cell, right? Like you sit in a little room and it's just, yeah, we've had private dining before where you have a group of people and you want to be away from everyone else. But this was just Charlotte and I. And we're sitting in like this little, it felt like a little jail cell. <laughs> they brought you the food and the food was great, but I, uh, I much preferred last night, I just put some photos up that included last night where it was much more traditional sort of Japanese thing, a whole bunch of people sitting around uh, and a, a bloke who looked like a sumo wrestler sitting there in the middle making all the food that was just, um, yeah, just super, super epic. All right, let's talk about breaches. Now, <clears throat> since last week, I went through a whole bunch of different data breaches. And as I explained in last week's video, uh, a lot of these breaches I've been processing, some of like the older ones, I've been processing as we've been doing this, this uh, RDBMS rollover exercise, we being Stefan and I. And, and the goal here has been to try and refine our SQL Server ingestion process to get data in there fast enough, such that when we deal with, I guess your typical data breach these days is millions of records, but when we deal with the ones that are hundreds of millions of records, I don't want it to be like a one day exercise to load data. Uh, particularly those really big impactful incidents, your time is kind of of the essence. You want people to know about it as soon as possible. So that's why when we go through these breaches, things like uh, the Taiwanese Android forum, apk.tw, two and a half million records from September, 2022. So it's, it's oldish. Now, every time I load a breach, I want to try and point to commentary on it. Uh, whether that be a disclosure notice by the organisation or, or press covering it. And the only one I could find for this one, and the next one as well, which we'll talk about in a moment, this is the Brazilian fast food company Habib's, 
the only reference I could find to breaches was uh, on that mother of all breaches, I called it mother of all beat ups, <laughs> that was circulating in the news a couple of months ago, which was kind of interesting. Gen 29, I've linked through to a cybernews.com story here. And uh, the APK.TW breach appears mentioned in here. And the Brazilian Habibs one also appears in there as well. And it looks like they were part of this corpus of data. And at the time when this, this data dropped, I sort of took a big sample and chucked it against Have I Been Pwned uh, and found that it, well, actually, when I say took a big sample, I looked at the names of the breaches, the largest breaches that were part of there, and looked at them, Have I Been Pwned, and went, yeah, you know, most of it's already there. But clearly there were things that were out there in circulation that I still had sitting there waiting to be processed that were part of this corpus. So we're still filling in the blanks. The Taiwanese one, IP address, email address, username, salted MD5 password hashes, 63% in Have I Been Pwn. Habibs, the Brazilian fast food one, that was three and a half million records. Breached in August 2021. Email IP, date of birth, phone, social profile links. So links off to your Facebooks or whatever. Uh, next one again, Flipkart. Flipkart had 552,000 records from September 2022. That's, uh, yeah, that's not massive. Only 23% already in Have I Been Pwned. And then the most recent one, which I did uh, just before heading out to Tokyo, Clickersnap. Now, Clickersnap, bless them, actually have a disclosure notice that I could link to. It's amazing how many organisations don't have a disclosure notice. Anyway, they had a disclosure notice. Goes back to September 2022. Email, username, SHA512, password hash. Don't only see SHA512 password hashes, but anyway, that's there. 56% uh, of those already in have been pwned. So these have all been breaches that, that, to be honest, like we've used to try and refine the ingestion process, as well as the fact that we do want Have I Been Pwned to be as complete as possible, but it's just such a backlog of data. Now, a lot of other stuff we're looking at every day, stuff, <laughs> one in particular at the moment, I'm trying to drive to disclosure, and this is, this is a company I don't think wants to disclose, so that's going to be interesting to see how, how that pans out. We might be talking about that <laughs> in a future weekly update. Okay, so, now there's those ones that were definitely breaches, all validated. Uh, one that popped up this week that definitely wasn't a breach is uh, OpenTable. Now, you wouldn't believe it, but sometimes hackers and criminals aren't entirely trustworthy. Now this one popped up during the week. Uh, someone, here we go. Uh, Hack Manic here has posted this on Twitter. Hack Manic has, has been very good at actually sharing stuff that is seen, posted to public forums and so on. 12 million open tables user, 12 million open tables users, email address and password linked, uh, leaked rather, on a hacking forum. Data published today referred to 2020 leak containing 12 million plus email address and passwords. Now, as soon as you sort of look at the sample that was posted to the website, it looks like credential stuffing. It's just email address, password pairs. If there's gonna be a data breach of the system, there are more than two columns and you normally end up with registration dates and internal IDs and all the sorts of stuff that was in the other four data breaches that I just mentioned. So this one popped up uh, and I quoted it because I wanted to bring it to OpenTable's attention and I said, has anyone seen anything on this alleged breach? Looks like it could be credential stuffing output if it's even valid at all. And then I went through and <laughs> very quickly figured out that like so many of these, it's all bullshit. Now, how do you establish it's all bullshit? Well, you've got 20 mil 21 million rows in this corpus of data, that's email addresses and plain text passwords, and there are six, as in one, two, three, four, five, six occurrences of the string open table. Every data breach always has loads of occurrences of the name of the breach in the data because it could be anything from people putting it in the email address, you know, maybe they've got a catch-all on their domain, so it's like opentable at mydomain.com. Maybe they're using sub-addressing, so it's like alias plus opentable at domain.com. 
Uh, there are always loads of people that use it as a password. You could argue that, oh yeah, it's credential stuffing, so usernames and passwords from other places wouldn't necessarily contain the word open table, but still, six out of 21 million. And then you look at the passwords, and some of the passwords are things like, I quoted four here, CBR9, as in lowercase CBR number nine. That's, uh, there's not many characters. That's a four character password. I don't think they're allowing that. A password of password, all lowercase. Very unlikely they've been allowing that. Password of one, two, three, four, five, six, and a password of loin. <laughs> well done. Why would you have loin? And then you go through and you see a bunch of username password pairs and email address password pairs. A little bit unusual for a credential stuffing list to have both of those in there. But what's really, really unusual is that the same username would appear over and over and over again with different passwords. Now, of course, you're only going to have one password for one username, whether it's a username, free text string or an email address. So, yeah, that's, that's uh, as I said here, firmly in the bullshit pile. OpenTable got in touch as well, and they said something to the effect of we have no evidence of a breach, which I don't like the wording because <laughs> it's that old saying of absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Like just because you can't find something doesn't mean that it didn't happen. But that's the, I guess, the normal response companies give. Okay, so that was that one. Now... The most interesting thing, where am I up to? What do I, <laughs> I even list what I'm gonna talk about today? Why does that do that more? Let's just go on to what I think is the most interesting thing. We don't even begin with this. It's just all, it's fun when there's a background and then something comes up and you're like, I knew there was, I didn't know that this was gonna happen. Let's just get into it. Krebs, <laughs> Krebs has done, a, uh, I, I think the word here is a Krebsing on a company called OneRep. Now, there are lots of data aggregators out there that operate across the spectrum of legality. The white pages is really a data aggregator, you know, where you get people's phone numbers and in Australia they still have physical addresses and names. Uh, that, that is a legal service all the way through to the really shady, dodgy stuff, which is just like selling your data for other people to steal your identity or target you with phishing attacks or things like that. There's a spectrum. And somewhere at the beginning of that spectrum is a whole bunch of stuff that's legal. There are many organizations out there that operate legally that sell your data to other people. Now, how do they get your data? Well, you know when you filled out that form, which is like win a free cruise, and you went, oh yeah, I like free cruises, I'll just give you all my personal data. And you didn't read the terms and conditions which said they're going to sell your data. That's how they actually make money. All of those services or all the other places where you leave information and we don't read the terms and conditions because we're normal humans. And it, somewhere in there is, look, we can share your data with partners and so on. And we, we get these organisations that have just huge, huge troves of data. Some of them have been breached before and appeared and have I been pwned. Uh, yeah, I, I think of things like Master Deeds in South Africa. So the Master Deeds service, which, <laughs> which leaked basically everyone in South Africa. When was this? Must have been about 2016, 2017. A legally operating service. So all these places out here that collect your data. Now, that has created a market for other companies to come along and charge you money to delete your data from the other services. Now this is not like full delete Ashley Madison style where Ashley Madison was charging people like $19 to remove their data after they had a few too many beers and thought it'd be a good idea to sign up and the next day sober up, it's like that wasn't good, $19, take your data out of our system. This is a company that will pop up and say, you can give us your information and we will go to all the different places that have your data and we'll ask them to remove it. There are multiple services that do this. We're only going to talk about one today, but I have had discussions with many others because these services want product placement on Have I Been Pwned. Because for them, that's like the, the gold mine of, of potential customers because someone's just found out their data has appeared in a data breach. Let's chuck them an ad for remove my data service and it'll cost you know seven bucks a month or something like that. 
they pay the money, these services go around and they remove your data from different places. Now, my problem with this has always been that every time one of these organisations reaches out and they say, you know, look, we're really here to help people protect their privacy, we're really privacy-centric, we want to help them get back control of their digital lives and everything. And I'll go, look, that's great, that's admirable. The issue I have with your service is that you can only remove data from other services that want to comply with your business model, largely legally operating services that will adhere to erasure requests. So you may well be able to offer a service where you remove people's data from the most legal, legitimate data aggregators, but you can't go to hacking forums, you can't go to identity theft forums or telegram channels or other places where people are doing the really, really nasty stuff and ask for data to be removed. I know what they'll say to you, it'll either be nothing or other things I can't repeat here. <laughs> like you cannot take people's data out of the worst places. So if you're selling a service where you're saying, come and give us money and we'll help erase you from the web so that you'll be safe, I don't feel that's a fair statement. And I think that the sorts of people that go and pay the money really don't understand that, that nuance. So as much as I've liked the idea of trying to help people get control of their privacy, I just don't think these services are going to be able to do a very good job of it. Now, for the most part, that's it. And up until yesterday, <laughs> up until yesterday, my view of these had been that the data removal services are legally operating above board, you know, privacy centric, that's fine. And then there was the Krebsing of OneRep. Now, OneRep is a company that I've chatted to before. Clearly, nothing has ever happened with, with OneRep. I have no commercial relationship with one rep a significant part of that being because of everything I just said I just don't think these services can actually do a very good job now what Krebs has done in the most Krebs of ways and I'm sure people listening to this are very familiar with Brian but just as like a, a, a 30 second background Brian for, for many many years has been very good at pulling the threads on cyber criminal underground forums and the likes and figuring out who is behind it, what they're doing, what entity is related to what, uh, going through doing a huge amount of really interesting OSINT stuff. Uh, and he's been very good at finding the, the operators of carding forums, for example. A lot of people don't like him because he's gotten a lot of stuff shut down. Anyway, he's very, very good at getting to the, the core of what is behind these things. And he started to pull the thread on one rep and what he's discovered is the CEO, Dmitry Shellist, from Minsk in Belarus, is running this service, OneRep, but has also been running all of these shady data aggregator services. And in the most Krebs of ways, he's gone through everything from DNS records to email addresses that match up to the point where at some point Dmitry's put like a two in the email address, but it's still obviously the same thing and it correlates across different stuff. He's gone back through Dimitri's Facebook profile and found ages ago all of these different shady data aggregators that he's gone through and liked on his own Facebook profile. Incidentally, deleted his Facebook profile just after the Krebs story came out. Maybe it's a coincidence. But long story short, it seems like Dimitri has been running all of these shady data aggregators and then running a service where you could pay money to remove yourself from the shady data aggregators. I mean, what a, what a genius this guy is. He's literally created the market for the business that he has then stood up. It's just, you have to, like I, was, I, had, uh, I had some messages from Krebs yesterday morning when I woke up and I'm laying in bed, blurry eyed, and I'll tell you why the connection to me in a moment. Laying in bed, blurry-eyed, reading this, going, <laughs> like, what? What? <sighs> now, here's the connection. There's an update to this. Krebs has said, many readers have pointed out something that was somehow overlooked amid all this research. The Mozilla Foundation, the company that runs the Firefox web browser, has launched a data removal service called Mozilla Monitor that bundles OneRep. That notice says Mozilla Monitor is offered as a free or paid subscription service. 
The free data breach notification service is a partnership with Have I Been Pwned, the Mozilla Foundation explains. The automated data deletion service is a partnership with OneRep to remove personal information published on publicly available online directories and other aggregators of information about individuals. Quote, data broker sites. So, we have had Have I Been Pwned baked into Firefox Monitor for many years. I want to say it's about six years. Uh, now, Mozilla pay for access to that data. They're a very, very big user of data. And then they offer that to their customers for free. Mozilla last month launched this service with OneRep, which is the one that allows you to pay money. I, I believe that, uh, that you do, I don't know the term they use, but like a premium Mozilla customer where you pay to then use the OneRep service to remove your data from data brokers. Uh, this is... This is a discussion that I've had with Mozilla in the past about this, this upcoming service, and I've expressed exactly the same thoughts as I have to everyone else here around the, the efficacy of it. Obviously, that's, that's something they thought was still worth doing, and I, I have massive respect for Mozilla too. They're a very, very privacy-centric company. But this does seem to have left them in a tricky situation. Now, Mozilla has said here to Krebs, they said, we were aware of the past affiliation with the entities named in the article and were assured they had ended prior to our work together. The statement reads, we're now looking into this further. We will always put the privacy and security of our customers first and we'll provide updates as needed. I, I really, really like Mozilla. I'm not sure that saying that they were aware of the past affiliations was the best thing to do, if I'm honest because the past affiliation look really, really bad. Now, maybe the nuance that's not caught in the language here is that they were, they're aware of some of it, but not all of it, or, you know, maybe not quite the, the severity of the services that the guy was running. I don't know. I don't know. It's, ugh, it's messy. Liam's here. They give you nonsense when you ask. I've GDPR'd several businesses and none have given me the data wanted and I'm an EU citizen. I think, I think there needs to be an episode. An episode? I don't know whether it's one of these things or we do it as a live thing on stage somewhere of what it actually means to be European and where GDPR gets you. Uh, in fact, I, I, do have a, I do have a good friend in the UK uh, who has been a data protection officer for some very large brands. Uh, in fact, we did a video together, John Elliott. We did a Pluralsight video just before, just before GDPR launched. Um, when was that? That must have been 2018, wasn't it? So we did this video together, just trying to sort of understand more about what the regulation was going to mean. Uh, and there were a lot of misunderstandings of it at the time, and a lot of misunderstandings even now. I see so many occurrences where people say, uh, I'm European, I'm within scope of GDPR, doesn't matter where you are, you've now got to do all of these things. Now, uh, I mentioned just before, there's, there's one data breach I'm trying to have disclosure done at the moment. There are a very, very significant number of European data subjects, is the term, data subjects in this breach, with personal information exposed. And it does seem like this organisation, who is not in the EU, uh, will not disclose. Uh, and we have had the GDPR discussion. Even Deezer, French Deezer, streaming music service, when they had over 200 million people exposed in a breach some time ago, they disclosed to their local regulator, but not to the individuals. <laughs> the individuals only learned when the data went into Have I Been Pwned. And you don't necessarily have to always disclose to the data subject either. There are carve-outs in there, don't quote me on all this, <laughs> because I'd much rather throw to people like John Elliott on this. There are carve-outs in there around when disclosure to individuals is actually required. I think part of, of what I, I lament, and I, I sort of, like, I get your position on this, Liam, but part of what I lament is the, the internet is such a, a global thing. You know, I'm here in Tokyo talking for free on, on the YouTube and you're, you know, like wherever in the world, we're all part of this one great big pile of data. And the suggestion that, uh, let's say, Charlotte, because of her nationality, gets protections that I don't because of my nationality, regardless of where the service is, it's just, 
to, to me doesn't pass the bullshit test. And in practice, this is what we're often seeing. In fact, I've seen many cases where people got in touch with me and they said, here's the response that I've gotten from my local regulator who I went to after a data breach of a service somewhere that, that didn't comply with our GDPR regulations. And I got a response from my regulator saying, they're out of our scope, they're out of our jurisdiction, can't really bring a case against them. A little bit different if it's like a Facebook or a Yahoo or something that has a global presence. But so many times, it's just well and truly outside the scope of what people can really do anything about. So going back to here, I, I think, Liam, you're talking about uh, one rep. My understanding is they're, you know, the, the guys in Minsk. You're like, mind you, eh, would that put them in scope? I don't know. But I think the point of saying, because GDPR, I get access to all these things, is, uh, is part of the problem. Liam says basically they made it up as they went along. <laughs> yep, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's quite feasible. Anyway, the one rep thing. It'd be very interesting to see how that pans out. I, I think what I find particularly concerning here is that Krebs sort of said it, at multiple times he's tried to get responses from, from one rep, uh, from the CEO himself. Uh, obviously, the, the guy's now going and just scrubbing stuff from the internet. Uh, It'd be great to be a fly on the wall at Mozilla, wouldn't it? You'd love to know the questions Mozilla is asking because that must be a big relationship between Mozilla and OneRep. So that would be uh, really curious to see. And incidentally, it is a massive, massive list of different domains that this guy's been sitting on running shady services from. Uh, it's like, and, and, and many of them are from different geographical parts of the world as well. Uh, just looking at some of these that I can actually pronounce, ifindy.com. <laughs> Looktoman.com, lookyrun.com, pplsource.com, scoutu2.com, and so many of these things have just been like shady services. Now, Krebs has actually linked each one of these through to web archive versions, where when I say shady services, like search64.com, enter a first name, enter a last name search. It's just, a, it's like a white page, isn't it? Now, he's linked through to an archive version from 2012 here. So maybe old mate was just like running dodgy services very early on and then he's reformed. Now he's decided to run a legit service because he's figured out there's money in being legit. But it doesn't look good at all. Ah, yeah, in fact, Krebs made the point here. So he must have just updated this today. Yeah, he did because I, I was reloading this earlier on. So, uh, no, no, all right. Bit about the Facebook, that same Facebook page that Mr. Shellist is still active, is now struck out. It says he's married, living in Minsk, update March 16. Mr. Shellist's Facebook account is no longer active. <laughs> the dude just gone and scrubbed it. I did mention one rep in the tweet thread that I put out. They haven't replied. So anyway, that'll just be an interesting one to see where that ends up. Okay, folks, I'm gonna wrap it up there. I will be home uh, next week to do this video from home, so at least I'll have all of my stuff. Sorry about the audio quality this week, but at least I made something work and I remembered last night and I didn't just like YOLO it into next week and forget about it. It's almost 400 of these I've done now every single week, uh, no matter where I was in the world and no matter how much other stuff was going on in life. So glad I haven't missed this one. Cheers, folks. See you back in Australia.